Little CPU can't take it. Okay. So technology widely accepted as the single most important source, right? Which is why, you know, up to 200 years ago, we really didn't see a lot of increase in GDP per capita or, you know, productivity. Uh, you know, technological change it is not just in whatever the industry is that it revolutionizes, right? So technological change it can impact industries beyond the primary application, right? So, you know, a lot of times we'll think about, you know, the transportation increases, right, that we've seen. But we don't really think about the fact that, you know, transportation uh, advances, you know, expanded the total market for farm produce. You know, advances in medicine communications electronics and computers. all have you know these these extra these beyond all have these uh, additional applications that boost productivity So, you know, we went from nothing moving faster than horse to, you know, the steam engine making river travel a thing to, you know, the, you know, railroad infrastructure to highways, right, to the invention of the airplane to now where we've got, you know, cell phone towers and 5G everywhere and information's whizzing faster than we can blink, right? So advances in technology are a big reason why we've had such advances in GDP per capita here in the United States. And it's part of the reason why, you know, other countries maybe aren't having as much luck in terms of their increase in GDP per capita. Now, just looking at the United States for a minute. There is a productivity puzzle that's going on, right? Where, you know, between 1948, so right after the war ended, to 1973, the labor productivity within the U.S., it grew by 2.5%. But then in the next period, 1973, to 1995, labor productivity, you know, it's still increased, but it only increased by 1.1%. Now, there was a resurgence of labor market productivity during the next little period. Went back up to 2.7%. But then, you 
in the next two periods, we get you know 1.5% increase and 1.0% increase. So what what happened? What happened in these periods, right? In these periods of tepid productivity. Why did the productivity slow down? And so the answer is, you know, it's it's somewhat of a mystery. There's a lot of different arguments, a lot of different viewpoints. Um, but, uh, you know, it may be that productivity typically is around, you know, productivity growth is around 1%. And, you know, we just had some kind of just some lucky periods, right? You know, this growth in this period, this can largely be attributed to, uh, you know, really the birth of, you know, the internet, computers, all that other kind of stuff, right? So, you know, information and communication technology, ICT, it made workers more productive. So not only did we have a new sector going on, going on board in terms of this, you know, making computers and designing computers and making websites, you know, but we also had uh, workers being more productive. And we also had just businesses being more efficient, just able to communicate more with their suppliers, able to communicate more with their consumers. Consumers had more information. So they were buying more. Just the, the kind of pace of, of business was increasing. So we saw growth both in the industries that produced the technologies as well as those that use them. So during that period, we actually saw slower growth for sectors that didn't use information or communication technology. All right, so number five, entrepreneurship and management. That special sauce. So entrepreneurs, those are the people that create new economic enterprises. new economic enterprises. So, you know, Mark Zuckerberg with Facebook and Sergey Brin and Larry Page with Google and uh, Bill Gates with Microsoft, uh, Henry Ford, mass production, right? All of these, they're, they're all entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship is, you know, a, a necessary element to a dynamic, healthy, growing economy. So really what we should be doing is we should have policies that channel entrepreneurship
in productive ways and not stymie it. So, you know, a taxation policy or regulatory regime, right? So, you know, just having bankruptcy. Bankruptcy available, having that available makes, uh, you know, starting new businesses less risky. So as a example, the book does a great job of talking about medieval China. So this is during the Song period, which was 960 to 1270 using our Western calendar. And during the Song period, you know, they were the most technologically sophisticated uh, people on the planet. You know, they had paper, they had water wheels, they had gunpowder, and there's some evidence that they even had a compass. That they even had invented a compass at this point. But instead of seeing, you know, a flourishing China in, you know, the 1300s and 1400s, right, we saw economic stagnation that followed. So why was that? Well, the social system limited entrepreneurship. And I'm sure it did it in a lot of different ways, but one of the ways that it did that, you know, was is, is really clear to historians and other people, right, is that, you know, the emperor, he retained all the property rights to the businesses. So the emperor could just go ahead and just seize your business, right, with no notice. So what's your motivation for actually putting a bunch of work into a company if as soon as it starts to become successful, it's just gonna be taken away from you? And so that's one of the ways that it limited entrepreneurship. The other way it limited entrepreneurship was that uh, there was a system of bureaucratic tests and essentially you know these were seen by the high class people as you know the way to go in terms of you know economic advancement right you know they were every they were given every two years you know once you passed it you had a job for life and you usually made a lot of money because you were corrupt as hell so as a result of this system that punished entrepreneurship and rewarded laziness and and lackiness and and corruption and stuff like that right we saw economic stagnation so the moral of this story is that scientific advances a 
alone do not ensure technical change and economic growth. Which leads us very nicely into, well, what were they missing? What was one of the big things that they were missing? Well, they were missing a good legal and political environment. So number six. Which is our last one. Yeah. And again, we know this as institutions. So we want political, we want laws, and we want, uh, you know, reward system, taxation systems that encourage people want to encourage people to be economically productive. We don't just want to discourage them from being economically unproductive or from being economically destructive, right? Which is what we do when we throw people in jail. They're being economically destructive, so we discourage them, right? We want to encourage people to be economically Productive. Well, how do we do this? Well, the big way that we do this is we need well-defined property rights. So we talked about how the property rights in medieval China, right? Uh, the emperor retained all of the property rights. Right, so he could seize their business with absolutely no notice. So property rights are the rules about, you know, who owns what. How those things can be used. And, you know, is there reliable nonviolent recourse, right? So what's nonviolent recourse? That's recourse through the courts. Right, because you know we're going to end up wasting a lot of time if every time there's a contract dispute, you go and you hire a bunch of goons to go and beat up the guy and get him to pay the money or you take his stuff or whatever the case may be. So these well-defined property rights, these things are essential. In addition... You need to maintain your political stability. If there's, you know, revolutions left and right, then, you know, the property rights don't really matter as much, right? Because somebody could come in and say, well, now we're doing things a new way and the uh, agreements that we made or the way that we did things before, we're not going to do that anyway. So, you know, having political stability is just as important as having these property rights. And then the last thing under here is you want to have institutions and you want to have laws and stuff that promote the free and open exchange of ideas. And you're not worried about people stealing those ideas. You, you can claim those ideas and you know, make the money off those ideas. You can have those ideas protected. It's the whole concept of intellectual property.
So is this all good? Right? Well, of course not. You know, Harry S. Truman, president back in the late half of the 20th century, said, you know, uh, give me a one-handed economist. Because every time he asked an economist something, the economists go, well, on the one hand, this, and on the other hand, this, right? You know, so there's always, on the other hand, when it comes to economics, so when we're talking about economic growth, there are some costs to economic growth. What are we talking about when we're talking about the costs to economic growth, right? Well, what's one of the main strategies for economic growth? You want to do what? You want to increase your capital stock, right? You want to increase your physical capital stock first, then you want to increase your human capital stock, right? But there's an opportunity cost. for producing more capital goods. The opportunity is you have fewer consumer goods now. And it might be that people are willing to forego present consumption to have more in the future, but a lot of times, you know, if you're, if you're already struggling, that's not the time to kind of start to set aside some savings, right? So there's this poverty trap that a lot of these countries get in where they just don't have enough money to invest in these capital goods, right? Because fewer consumption goods would mean that, you know, some people would die or something, right? But going back to the developed world, right? The opportunity cost of producing more, uh, more capital goods is, you know, gonna be reduced leisure time as a whole. There may be some possible health risks. From, you know, rapid capital production. A few years ago, there was a low income hotel in London that caught on fire. Um, what else? There was a bridge that collapsed in Miami. So, you know, the, the, when, because they were trying to go really fast. They were trying to go ahead of schedule and it ended up in disaster. There's a cost There's a research and development cost to all capital goods. Right? So, you know, for that bridge, there's a ton of research and development cost. And then there's, you know, obviously the cost of the education to develop and then use the new capital. So if we're talking about, you know, new machines for uh, building new types of uh, wind turbines or something like that, right? So this leads us into our next point, right? Which is that, you know, when you're, when the government is not promoting uh, human capital, or, or sorry, when it's not promoting physical capital, it could be promoting human capital. So you can promote growth with human capital. And again, we're just using K as our abbreviation for capital. So, you know, we're used to this, but it's not a standard throughout the world, right? But we're used to the fact that, you know, K through 12, all that, you know, education was free, right? You know, governments, they support education and training programs for a reason. It's not just so your parents have a free babysitter, right? So it's the fact that, you know, there's a return to education 
that's beyond the individual return. So when we talk about, you know, returns beyond individual returns, that should be, you know, ding, 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 right? I'm talking about externalities, right? Education has externalities. So a few of those are, you know, democracy. just works better with educated voters. The more educated people we have, the higher income we have, since we have a progressive tax system, That means that it's going to capture some of that higher income. That's going to be the result of the larger education. There's going to be increased chances of technological innovation. And it addresses some inequity concerns. So remember I talked to you guys before about inequality and I said it's different than inequity. Inequality is about how, you know, people aren't receiving a fair share of things. Inequity talks about how people aren't receiving the same chance at things. And so, you know, the fact that, you know, poor families that, you know, couldn't pay to send their kids to school, right? Still get to benefits. And, you know, their children have a greater chance of not being poor. Study after study after study has shown how true that is. So we can promote growth through savings and investment. And let's skip right now because there's actually, this is in the news, where, you know, the government can invest directly in capital formation. There's the American Jobs Bill, right, which has all that money for infrastructure and everybody's debating about what infrastructure is instance, the U.S. Interstate Highway System reduces the cost 
of transporting goods. And so it's making markets more efficient. So are there limits to this growth, right? Can we just kind of grow forever? We've got some issues. Kind of running out of stuff. The recycling's not working. So there's some depletion of some natural resources. It's going to end up really causing economic growth to be harder and harder to you know, accomplish every year. We've got environmental damage. And when we run these things through, you know, computer models, they conclude that, you know, everlasting growth is not sustainable. However, few things that these computer models did not take into account. They didn't take into account the fact that, you know, every year we have new and better products that usually, you know, use less resources, right? Didn't take into account the fact that, you know, increases in income could be used to pay increases in environmental quality. And then lastly, these models, they fail to, you know, so they are ignore, they fail to integrate the fact that the market will respond to increasing scarcity. So what are we talking about? You know, higher prices triggering some response. like, you know, the strong reaction to the energy crisis in the mid 1970s. Or even, you know, in the, uh, the early 2000s, the price of gas went up. And as a result, everybody changed away from, you know, they sold their big SUVs, their gas guzzling SUVs. However, this is all not to say the fact that government action is needed in cases of externalities.
those situations where you know there's a third party not the buyer or the seller that's being impacted and the way in which the government reacts to that is you know really important right so if the government comes in and says you know this is the specific thing that you need to do uh you know that might not be as good as the government coming in and just saying hey you got to stop stop doing this right so uh one of the great examples i like to talk about is uh sawdust right so you know the old uh lumber mills they'd always locate off of uh, a river right because they needed the water for the for the saws and everything like that well they also would just dump the sawdust in the river well the sawdust would go and it would kill the fish and it would go down river and it would you know mess up with the cities and stuff like that right so the government came in and said hey you can't do this shit with the sawdust anymore you really gotta you gotta do something with it you can't just put it in the river anymore right they didn't tell them exactly what to do they just said you can't put it in the river anymore well at the same time there were some advances in uh like glues and this entrepreneur thought well hey maybe i could take all that sawdust and all those like little bits of particles and things that fly off the uh the sawmill right maybe i could take that with this new glue stuff and press it into boards and that's how particle board was was made and so this guy took this stuff that you know essentially at first the lumber mills were paying him to take off his hand instead of him paying for to actually buy stuff right he was getting them to pay him to take this trash off of their hands and he was making this trash into this great uh, economic product right so it's a that's a that's a great success story of government coming in because there was this negative externality but then you know entrepreneurship and the market really finding a clever solution to that you know negative situation and solving that externality all right that's everything for chapter seven you guys are good to go up to date uh the final will be due or sorry the midterm will be due monday evening so we'll still have classes on monday like normal uh and yeah have a good one